When you say that you, are, you, you don't like to be too rigid in what you have and you're always flexible and you listen and you can change, does that not come because you're now not comfortable in what you do, but you have a degree of, not certainty, but confidence about yourself. Mm. Whereas a younger designer may not have that confidence and may feel the one or two ideas mm. he or she has is it, and mm. if that's threatened, what do they do? Mm. Um, did that's it true. take you a time to come to a degree of confidence, or? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. No, I think I'm better at what I do now than I did, than I was 25 years ago. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, no, definitely, you know, you become, because there are also certain things that you feel less worried about, you know. I used to be very worried by the process of, you know, how do I do this thing? How do I make it? How do I make it happen? Um, and in fact, you know, one of the advantages of doing the same thing over a long period of time is that you have, you begin to develop a innate foresight into what, might be a problem and um, and how to solve that problem, how to begin to solve that problem when you should be solving the problem rather than it becoming a, an issue. Um, so, and, and I think that's something that I really enjoy, you know, at this part, you know, stage of my life. I'm really, I enjoy um, having that having had the opportunity to uh, have worked um, a fair amount and to have gained a lot of experience over a period of time. And how long did it take you to get to that state? Um, I think, let me think, because I really started designing when I was 19 um, and I'm now 50. So, um, I would say when I was in my late 30s, mid 30s, I really felt, you know, now I've begun, I've begun to sort of understand <coughs> how to do what I do. You know, it's very difficult because there's so many things that, so many factors are, which are to do with having practical experience and also studio experience and, but not being hampered by your practical experience so that you're frozen in your studio so that you still are able to present ideas which are, you know, on some level impractical and that then people come together and solve them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I know more now when to push a little bit and uh, when in fact, there may be solutions that haven't yet been found, but I know and that there, there may be to push beyond uh, to push into the next level of trying to solve a problem. Because sometimes you don't solve something right away. And sometimes, you know, I think it's, um, for me, I think, it's important to also understand when to hold back on an issue of something that is a complicated issue and say, listen, we have to leave that now and then we'll move on to something else and then you come back to it and you understand it and you solve it. It's not a... So I think that, you know, when you're at a certain age, you understand. And when do you decide to give something up? Um, say the blood, uh, you know, the two and half the inches blood. of blood on stage, right. um, either budget or technical or safety or whatever reasons, uh, when do you see the point, well, no, I just have to move on and change this idea? Um, I think when you think that the idea has been altered beyond repair. And so, you know, I've had the misfortune to work on projects where I've pushed something too far and in fact it's found or I've tried to alter a design to accommodate the technical requirements again and again and again until the design is sort of essential nature of the design begins to disappear mm -hmm. and I think at that point you really do have to say okay this is not working this design um, it's not working physically for your theater and it's lost its, you know, beauty. So you then have to 
go back and 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 do and rework and find and find another design. I think that's usually the right. point. Um, yeah. You talk about squares. Mm. You talk about problem. You talk a lot about problem solving. It's very interesting. It's mm. very. Is there a connection? I just I will just go to a, a, a wider question for a little, and then we'll go back to more practicals. Is there a question between a, a link between aesthetics and philosophy? Mm-hmm. And the kind of aesthetics you have about space, about metaphor, about feeding that the character, listening to the music. Is there a philosophy under there? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Got a yes answer. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Move on. No. Um, I mean, no do you yeah, read? Do you like think, poetry? But I also think that you know, I do think that it is about. I mean, you know, for example, I talk about problem solving. I actually enjoy. I love problem solving because I love that interaction with other people. I think that's one of kind of. It's a really joyous interaction when you get a group of people together and that they have they're presented with a problem. And everyone's trying to figure it, out, figure it out, you know, whether it's my problem or somebody else's problem that's come up. And so it's actually, it's a really, it's very creative, collaborative experience. And some people are better at, better at it than, than, than others. I think some people are intimidated by it, so they close down. So, mm-hmm. so it's nice to, when you're working with people, in fact, to, you know, bring out their creative expertise on a project and try to kind of make that come alive. So, in fact, there is a philosophy in that, is that I enjoy, the, I enjoy those, those, you know, it's not, it's not a problem, it's an issue, it's something to be solved, it's something to be worked out, it's something, and, and if you take on the challenge, sometimes the, something quite, the exchange can be quite joyous, that's, that takes place with, with I mean, it's one of the things that I, I really enjoy about working with in the theater is that, you know, we're all trying to figure it out at the same time to present something, some level of clarity to the audience. Um, you know, if you haven't done your job correctly, then an audience is watching and they're a little bit confused by the language that's on stage, so they don't quite... Right. I mean, you're always trying to... I think you're, it's about clarifying something um, I mean, I always think that sometimes when I approach something that's older, like a 19th century piece of theater or opera, you know, you're taking this piece that has been around for quite a long time, and maybe it's it's some sort of beautiful gem that's a bit dusty, and you know, and I think your job, my job as a designer, is to somehow kind of help to clean it and make it sparkle for the audience as it did when it was first written and performed. So that they are filled with the thrill of the first performance, because that's what, you know, that, that is partly my job um, as a designer. And I think it's to give, to make it feel fresh and new and um, like it's never been seen before. So, 